Luke chapter 1, story of story of Zacharias. A great story about a great man of God, totally obscure individual. And that's who God uses, uh, obscure people like us to advance the gospel of Christ as the Savior and the Messiah. Um, there is a, a story about a guy that I'm going to introduce you to. He's totally obscure, uh, and God used him in a, a fantastic way years ago. His name is George. George. Uh, he's born uh, Christmas season, December the 16th, year 1714. Uh, his dad, his name was Thomas. His dad was a struggling innkeeper in uh, uh, Gloucester, England. Uh, when uh, George was only two years old, his dad passed away, leaving his mom with multiple children to run the inn. Uh, it was hard for her for many, many years. Uh, when he became 15 years old, he decided, I need, to, I need to leave school. I don't like school anyway. I'm not that bright. And just quit school and help mom. So he did at 15. Uh, in the evenings, uh, running an inn, when he got night duty, there's not a whole lot to do back then. They don't have flat screen TVs. They don't have cell phones. It's in the 1700s. You know, I mean, what does a young person do at 15 when there's nothing else going on? You read. Yeah, so he started to read. Uh, his mom had a Bible there. And so he began to read the, the Bible in the evenings. And he read it, and he read it, and he read it, and he read it. And it soaked into his soul. One day, uh, there was a, a young student from Oxford who happened to stay at the, at the inn. And the young man began to interact with George and eventually told George, you know, George, you need to, you need to go back to school and finish your education. That'd be the best thing you could possibly do. And so he listened to the Oxford student, and eventually, uh, as a teenager, he enrolled back in school, finished school, and he wound up uh, at a cool school called Pembroke College at Oxford. There, he, George, happened to run into a guy named Charlie, Charlie Wesley, Charles Wesley, know him, who gave him a book. The book was titled, The Life of God in the Soul of Man. Uh, Charles Wesley told George, uh, you need to read this book, and so he did, and he memorized that book basically he read it so often uh, at the end of reading in that book uh, he became a believer in Jesus Christ as the Messiah and and throughout his life uh, he constantly referenced that book that Charles Wesley had given him as being the turning point in his life from no belief to belief changed him radically uh, as he was trying to finish up his education uh, as he went on to college uh, uh, he who was not academically gifted uh, younger, all of a sudden his mind is full of learning and wanting to grow and to flourish. Uh, but as he's working his way through college, uh, he, wasn't a, he wasn't a big man. He was very frail in his built. Got sick. I had to take nine months off from school. Went back home, helped his mom with the inn. Uh, began to serve at church uh, in, in Gloucester, England, where they lived. Uh, the bishop was so amazed at his talents and abilities, he, he ordained him as a deacon and then as a priest of the Church of England. And on June 20th, 1736, George, a former struggling Student finished a degree at Oxford. Amazing, this insignificant man from an insignificant family. George Whitfield was his name. George Whitfield, uh, he was the one who, through his preaching, uh, brought the Great Awakening to England and then took 13 trips across the ocean to bring the word of God to the Americas. Amazing man of God. When uh, London's population was only 700,000 people at the day, uh, 20,000 people would show up to hear George preach. That was some kind of preacher. He had a theatrical background at one point in his life. He had great abilities to pre uh, uh, present the word of God in fresh, new, uh, amazing ways. And people in droves would show up. And this is all before uh, headphones and, and microphones and sound systems. I would submit to you, if I turn my microphone off right now, we might have like a Christian riot. I couldn't hear that guy. What was he saying? I mean, this, he had such an amazing voice that attracted people. And many thousands of people in England were led to Christ. And then many thousands of individuals were led to Christ as he preached to huge masses of individuals uh, at his day before the American Revolution. He brought the Great Awakening to the United States. One of his good friends was Benjamin Franklin. Imagine that. This little old boy from Nowheresville winds up knowing Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin uh, wasn't the epitome of uh, Christianity. Uh, and uh, George was trying to win his friend uh, Benjamin to Christ. Because... Uh, Back in the day of the colonial days, uh, the printing presses in the colonies doubled their printing press activity because of the volume uh, that he produced in writing about the Christ. Imagine if you took all the, the publishers in the United States today, if one pastor presented so much stuff people wanted to read, it doubled their print load. That's an amazing pastor. At one point in his uh, desire to reach George or Benjamin, George reaching Benjamin, um, Benjamin being one of his printers, uh, he wrote this to his friend, Benjamin Franklin. He says, if you, as you have made pretty considerable progress in the mysteries of electricity, boy, that was an understatement, <laughs> isn't it? I, I would now humbly recommend to your diligent, unprejudiced pursuit 
and study the mystery of the new birth. The amazing words. See, he constantly debated with Benjamin Franklin the need for a savior in his life. He never accepted that word from George, but George is constantly speaking to his friend about the need to know the savior. It is estimated that in his uh, lifetime uh, that he preached over 18,000 sermons. Now that means absolutely nothing to you because you're thinking, well, Marty does that probably in a year here, right? Uh, no, let's think about it. 18,000 sermons. So knowing you're a type A church, are you not? Yes. In fact, that is the main difference between the two coasts. Laissez-faire, type A. I'm just saying. 18,000 sermons. So bear in mind, I got out my calculator knowing what you're like, and I crunched some numbers. Now, the, <laughs> Okay, so it has to be kind of exact. So barring a vacation here and there, at my last church where I was at for 19 years, preaching every Sunday, 52 weeks a year, you know, I got X amount of vacations, blah, blah, blah. I speak four times a Sunday here. I've been here for six years, times whatever, blah, blah, blah. I have preached in 25 years 1,978 times. Did you compare the two? 18,000, and he died at 56 years old, and I'm 56 years old, and I've preached 1,900. I know why he died at 56 years old. <laughs> so I go home now after four, and I'm like, man, I'm dead. And I read this this week, and I'm thinking, unbelievable. That means he averaged two per day, two sermons a day. That's mind-boggling. God used him in such a great way. All the money that he made from all of his books, uh, he took the majority of it and he gave it away to little, little children who were disadvantaged. That's what he did. He took an orphanage in Georgia and poured all kinds of money into it to reach the less fortunate. A man who it wasn't about him, it was about him being the hands and feet of Christ to other people. See, God took an obscure young man whose mother's name was Elizabeth, which means God is gracious, and the world was graced because of one man. You, you don't know who you're raising right now in your family. And by the same equation, it only takes one person sold out to God to turn a nation back. Did you know that? I firmly believe that. It takes one person sold out to God Almighty. That was George Whitfield. But his mom's name was Elizabeth, which makes me think of another Elizabeth. Doesn't it you? Which one? Zacharias's wife was named Elizabeth. Uh, and we know the story. I don't know if you were here last week, but uh, we'll just recap the story of Zacharias. He's a priest. Uh, and they roll the dice, as it were, to see who's going to get the going to the temple, the holy temple and present altar of incense, the prayers of the saints before the Holy of Holy Curtain. Great opportunity, you get to do it once in your life. Maybe if, if the lot's chosen for you, number falls on him. He's around 70 years old. He gets to go into the temple, the holy place. It's an awesome opportunity. He just goes in there to pray for the nation of Israel. And that's when Gabriel the angel shows up and tells him, I got great news. You and your wife in old age are gonna have, have a son. And God wants you to name him John. When an angel appears to you, what are your options? Embracing what the angel says or argumentation. What did he choose? Argumentation. Have you considered my wife? She, have you seen her? What she look, look at us. 70. We're not going to be having children. Argues with the angel. And the angel does what to him? It's test time. Four people were in church last week. Yeah. Strikes him. He can't hear and he can't speak. And we know he can't hear because if you keep reading the text, which we will today, people are communicating him by, by making sign language to him in signs because he can't hear. He's a deaf mute all of a sudden. He went in hearing and speaking, he comes out deaf mute because of his unbelief. So the mouth that wouldn't believe and the ears that heard the word of God and wouldn't believe it, God said, I will judge you until the time comes you have belief, then I will remove that. He was uh, deaf mute for nine months while his wife was pregnant. Amazing. And from his little life, this obscure life of this old priest, uh, in this new story, we're going to encounter another episode, episode four, of an amazing work in his life in those nine months. See, your unbelief can't trump the work of God. Did you hear me? Your unbelief cannot trump the work of God in, in, in your life. So I don't care what he's done in your life, what's happened to you, what tragedy, what pain, doesn't matter, what sin you've committed, it cannot trump what God wants to do. He may do things to get your attention, but he wants you to move from unbelief to belief. And that's what, that's what we see in chapter uh, 1, 57 through 80. Not that we're going to cover all those verses, uh, but we're going to cover a, a chunk of them this morning. We're going to look at a man who's going to move from solitude, he can't speak, to total gratitude when he can speak. And this is going to be a lesson for us at Christmas, is that God wants us to, to move from our solitude of not speaking about him to saying great things about him. So let's look at two things in this uh, episode, two, two concepts. Number one is what I would call the problem in this family feud. I don't know, 
a lot of Christians in our church, you probably don't fight at home, right? <laughs> yeah, you had an argument this morning, right? Yeah, coming to church, yeah. Don't family feuds like start at a time you didn't anticipate? Just minding your own business and bam, you're hit by, you're hit by a bus. What in the world? Have you ever had feuds when all the relatives come over? Confess now. This has happened to you? Yeah, one person? Talk about lying next Sunday. So, uh, see, <laughs> they, they're going to have a family feud at the most amazing time of their life. This senior citizen couple is going to have a child, the messianic forerunner. We're talking amazing. Now, all the friends and family get together for the day of circumcision when the child is born, and, and it's not going to go well. Verse 57. It says, now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she gave birth to a son, just like the angel said, prophecy fulfilled. Her neighbors and her relatives, oh, they heard that the Lord had displayed his great mercy toward her, and they were all rejoicing with her. No kidding. If you had a 70-year-old aunt who got pregnant and was going to have a child, you'd be rejoicing with, well, you might be talking to her, telling her, it's, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be exciting. They're rejoicing with her. It says, no, it happened. What happened? The feud. It happened that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child and they were all going to call him what? Zacharias. Why? After his father. Who's the they? The relatives. Those pesky relatives. In-laws. Thank you, Jack. I, I wasn't even, I couldn't even comprehend saying that, but yes, it's possible. In-laws, meddling mother-in-law. Oh, isn't it so sweet? She's going to have a child. You're going to name him Zacharias. That's what we do in our culture. Blah, blah, blah. All the, all the relatives, all the neighbors are all saying this. And then a feud broke out. Because in their culture, you were going to name the child after the father. So Zacharias Sr. is going to be Zacharias. Are you with me? In Western concepts. And all of a sudden, the mother steps forward. Remember her name? Elizabeth. Oh, she's kind of fiery at this point. In fact, she's fired up. Notice what she says in verse 60. When it starts with the word but, it's not going to be a good thing. Do you follow me? It's an adversative. But the mother, Elizabeth, answered and said to the relatives and to the, the meddling neighbors, no indeed, but he shall be called John. Now, you have to really appreciate this in the Greek text because this is emphatic in Greek. This is not, not, this is not like a cordial oh no, thank you for saying that, but we're thinking about John. Uh-uh, it's not that way at all. This is like, no way would we ever entertain that concept, the way it's presented in Greek. And then the adversative, the word but, the second one, but he shall be called, they have two options in Greek to state a contrast, de or Allah. De is a mild adversative. Allah is a major adversative. It matters which one she chose. Which one do you think she chose? De, the, the minor one, or Allah, the big one? She chose all of you. Your interpretation is so good. She chose the powerful one to say, no way is this happening, but in a major adversative way, we picked that name because God picked the name. What's the name? John. Now, the family was not willing to lay the argument down there, as happens in family feuds, right? That's why they're called feuds. They kind of go on. They weren't wanting to lay that down. And so in verse 61, they said to her, notice their argument. There's no one among all your relatives who's called by that name. Probably in that tone, you know. Are you out of your mind? No one has that name in your family lineage. Why in the world would you want to pick John? Well, um, verse 62 is most, most interesting. They don't give up the argument. They now turn to Zacharias. Now, bear in mind, in the setting, what's his issue? What's wrong with him? He, 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 he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on. He hasn't a clue as to what's going on. He just thinks it's circumcision day. So they turn to him, and it says in verse 62, I love this. This is the humor of scripture. They made signs to his father as to what he wanted him called. You can only imagine how you would do this in Hebrew. You know what I mean? What did they do? I would have loved to have been there. And what's most interesting is in verse 63, he asked for a tablet. I don't know, Staples somewhere supplied it. Something to think about. Asked for a tablet. And he wrote as follows. He just wrote. And if he was speaking Greek, which he could have been, because many of them were bilingual. He wrote this. Uh, his name? Yoenes. Uh, Yoenes. John. John. That stopped the argument. 
dad had spoken. Who gave him that name? The angel. If the angel names your child, you just don't argue with that kind of stuff. He says, it's John. You know, this leads to an interpretive question. Why in the world would God Almighty break cultural tradition and make them change the name of the child? Got any ideas? Well, I'll, since I'm talking, I'll tell you what I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> I think that God said, change his name to John, and don't make it be Zacharias. God remembers. That's what it means in Hebrew. Uh, change it to John. God is gracious, because God is going to be gracious. Why? Because after 400 years of prophetic silence, God is now going to speak through John the Baptist. Talk about grace to sinners. And so God says, change his name. And also, I don't really want him known as from that family line of Zacharias, although that's his family line, but he's going to be like my chosen vessel. Unique name, unique name. Now, this may not shock you, but that's just my introduction. Shocked? No, no, you're not shocked because there's so much to talk about. And that's just the setting up of the problem to the family feud because John just wrote down the name of my child's name is, Zacharias says, is John. For him to write that is an amazing faith statement because he didn't believe that originally. Remember when he's in the holy place? He didn't believe that, but now he believes it. He's had nine months to think about his disobedience to God. And now when he articulates those words, puts them down in writing, well, then God's going to allow him to be able to speak for the first time in nine months. What comes out of his mouth is, is amazing. It's what I call the praise. It's going to come out like, like a, just flood out, like a, out of a gate. It's going to pour out. The praise is going to come out of his mouth. And it's amazing. It's going to come out first for the Messiah and then praise for his son. When I was a kid back in the 60s, uh, were you alive in the 60s? How many? Okay. Wasn't it fun to be alive back then? Two people said it was. Yeah. You know, do you remember the 60s? You know? Yeah, I do. Uh, there wasn't a lot of rules and regulations like we have now. You could, like, you could, there was a much more, it was looser. Case in point, I submit to you for your analysis. Uh, when I was a kid in the Imperial Valley of, of Southern California, it was all agricultural, a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, canals and things you know, to water all the agriculture. Uh, there was a small dam uh, that was east of our city, uh, not a massive dam, but a pretty good-sized dam. Uh, and my mom found out about it and said, hey, I, I heard it's a really great place to go picnic and, and, and have fun and, uh, and swim. So I was about five or six at the time. Uh, and so she said, we're going to go pick, get, Get Kenny, your best friend, and, and we'll take your sisters, and we'll, we'll go have a picnic. Get Kenny's mom, Margie, and we'll go off and have a nice day at the base of the dam. So we did. And so we got there, and park. there's no parking lot or anything. Remember, it's the 60s. Went down an old dirt road. I found a break in the, the side of the little river bank. I set up some, you know, uh, blankets for the picnic and everything. And then my mom and Margie said, you kids go off, and oh, there's lots of sandbars out there. Go have fun. I'd never seen a sandbar, so walked out into the knee-deep water, walked out to the farthest sandbar. You know, you're a child. you got to go to the farthest sandbar. So we were way out there in the middle of this. It wasn't a river, but there's water flowing slowly from the dam. So we're out there playing. No signs telling you not to go there. We played and played and played. Had a great time. I was noticing while we were playing that on the dam were these massive horns. I'm not talking animal horns. I'm talking horns, like for sounding. And as we're playing, <laughs> they went off. Uh, uh, like that, just started going like that. And I'm like, what in the world? I look at my friend Kenny, what in the world? I, I, we look over at the shoreline, and I see my mom and Margie, <laughs> and they're running at us, screaming, out of the water. Remember, it's the 60s. Here they would have walls, electrified fences, signs, don't go near the water. You know, it's, it's government regulated, don't even look at the water, blah, blah. There, there, <laughs> there, we, there we could actually get in it at the base of a dam. So the horns go off, and so we, we basically walk on water getting to my mother, uh, and we set up shop alongside the, the little river bank there and, and uh, you know, start having a picnic, and pretty soon the gates open. I've never seen that happen before. I don't even know if I've been and seen it in person before. Since then, the gates came down, whoof, out came the water. That's Zacharias' heart. See, it's been pent up, his praise for God, and all of a sudden, at the moment of great belief, the gates come down. And out of his heart comes praise, like a gushing torrent, like I saw coming out of the dam that day. It makes you want to ask yourself, when is the last time I was so overcome with the work of God that my soul just gushed forth praise? Because I can tell you, there's a lot of stuff that gushes out of our souls, and it ain't praise. I mean, when's the last time 
that it just gushed forth. See, that's what's going to happen to him as he gets great, un- great belief replaces unbelief in his life. Verse 64 says, At once his mouth was open and his tongue was loose, and he began to speak in praise of God. Boy, did he. When's the last time that you did that? In verse 65 it says, Fear came up on all those living around them, reverential fear of God, because of what they're hearing. And all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. I mean, have you heard about Zacharias? Have you heard about Elizabeth, the son? And Gabriel showed up. This is going to be some kid. See, all who heard them kept in mind saying, what then will this child turn out to be? This is an interesting twist because this is not what they were asking prior. They were asking prior, why are you going to name him John? Now what are they asking? No telling what John's going to do in his lifetime for God. See, even they've embraced belief. They don't tell me praise isn't cap, 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 uh, uh, catchy. Th- their praise is catchy. And so they praise the, the, the Lord, and it's catchy to the society, and everybody gets excited about it. When's the last time you were so overcome with the work of Christ at Christmas, of what he has done to bring the Messiah, that you got so joyous about it, you just had to let other people know? The other night, I went out to dinner with four pastors. Well, there's four of us, the three, three other guys. And we were at a restaurant, and having a great time talking. When pastors get together, it's just heavy-duty theological discussion, so to a degree. And a young lady comes up with the, you know, the bill and everything, and, and she tells us, you know, uh, happy holidays, guys. Wrong group. <laughs> just the wrong group. And we're looking at each other, and it's like, is it a holiday? So one of the pastors said, uh, young lady, which holiday might it be? She's like, uh, it's a holiday? Which holiday? Oh, well, it's, it's a Christmas holiday. You got that right. See, this season is about what? The birth of Christ. It's, it's not a holiday. It's the birth of the Son of God. See, our culture says, oh, that's verboten. Don't, don't talk about that. Oh, yeah, talk about that. See, a heart that wraps its mind around what God has done is filled with praise to talk about it in a joyous fashion. See, I would love what it says in uh, verse 66. It says, the hand of the Lord was certainly on him, on Zacharias, uh, and after his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit, he prophesied. I mean, he's so full of God, he just can't help but to say amazing things about God. Have you ever had God so on you that out came the praise? I'm talking about God so in your life, and you can't even explain his presence to someone else. I've tried it. It doesn't work. He's so on your life. And it could be at a really hard time, a really great time. But God shows up in a powerful way, and you just know he's there. And when he shows up, praise shows up. That's what happened with Zacharias. See, the gate came down of unbelief, and out came the praise of God. Uh, Paul understood this. That's why he wrote Ephesians 5.18 to Christians. Here's what he said. Don't get drunk with wine. Why? That's dissipation. That's a waste of your time. What should you be doing as a Christian? What's he tell you? It's a by way of command, present tense command. You as a Christian should be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is a whole theological discussion, but let's just summarize. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, your sin's forgiven, you're made a new person. And you are at that moment placed into the body of Christ, sealed by the Spirit of God. He comes to indwell you, to to help you to choose holiness and walk with God. You're a totally different person. The Spirit's indwelling you. I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 tells you that much. So does Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. But he, we're talking about filling here. Filling is a whole different issue. Paul says, be filled with the Spirit. He dwells you. Now the question is, how much are you going to let him control you? Your thoughts, your actions, the way you work, the way you raise your children, the way you talk to your wife. How much are you going to yield to God to be used of him? See, the more you yield to him, the more filled you are and controlled by him. And that logically results in verse 19, Ephesians 5. Notice what Paul says. When that happens, you will be speaking to one another in what? Psalms, mm, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks for, I love this. I don't always like this, but I love this. Always giving thanks to the Lord for just the things that you like that happen. No, all things, all things. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, even to the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Notice the cause-effect relationship. As you submit to yielding to God's spirit to transform you in the likeness of Christ, you logically resort to instant praise of him. You can always tell how closely you are in walking with God and being filled by him by how much praise fills your life. Well, my spiritual gift is cynicism. (laughs) Sorry. 
You know, I just like, you know, tear people down and make them humble. Really? Yeah. My, 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 my spiritual gift is just, just like pe- making sure people know the facts, the dirt about other people. That's what I do. Really? If you're really walking with God and he's got a hold of you, out of your mouth will come joyous singing. How many here would say, I cannot sing? It's not a good thing. Hmm? Yeah. You know what? If you're overcome by the spirit of God, you're going to sing. Have you ever had a song from church you get stuck in your head on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you're wanting to call Darren and go, thanks. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Happens to me. I'm like, why did we sing that song? Well, God stuck that, that tune in your head, right? And you're singing it in your head. For what reason? Praise to God. You ever had an old hymn just kind of pop up in your head? You know, an old hymn just pop up in your head? And then all of a sudden, it's like, man, it's in my head. Sing. In your truck, in your car, commuting, in your cubicle, in the Pentagon, walking around. I don't know where you're at. But when God comes down and touches your soul and you're excited about what he's doing, it evidences itself in a musical, joyous spirit. Gosh, I can't even tell you how many times. As when I was a gardener for many years, out in the middle of the boonies, hula hoeing, all the stuff I used to do, songs would hit me like in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. You know, he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. <laughs> Gee, it just comes out of you. If it's not coming out of you, two things are true. Either you don't know God or you're not walking intimately with him. See, Zacharias walked intimately with him. Out came the praise. Praise logically comes out. What greater thing could you do for Christ this Christmas season than to have a life that just is like a mighty torrent of praise to him? Leah in the Old Testament, she has her last child. His name, Judah. And when she has Judah, according to Genesis 29, verse 35, she says this. She conceived and bore a son. And she said, this time I will praise the Lord. Uh, That's capital L-O-R-D, meaning that's Yahweh, the covenant God. She says, therefore, she named him Judah. And then she stopped bearing. See, God did something great in her life, gave her a son named Judah. Who's Judah? Oh, who's Judah? Judah is the progenitor of the Messiah Jesus who's from that tribe. She gave from her came the great messianic line. Amazing. She praised God. Moses in Exodus 15, in his old age, after the parting of the Red Sea and deliverance from Egypt with all the 10 plagues, etc., in Exodus 15, he writes an entire song. We don't know what the tune is, but we know the words. He sings an entire song to God. Lyrics of verse 2. Ah, the Lord, he's my strength. And, and song. And he has become my salvation. He says, this is my God and I will praise him. My father is God and I will extol him. Old man Moses says, when I look back at what God has done, man, I can just only sing to him. I can praise him. When's the last time you just broke forth in joyous praise singing worship? Deborah, in Judges 5, after she, the prophetess, uh, is instrumental in, in getting rid of uh, the wicked Sisera warrior, Canaanite man, um, says, says this to God in a song. J- Judges 5 is another entire song. She, she sings in verse 3, Hear, O kings, give ear, O rulers, to the Lord. That's Yahweh, the covenant God. I will sing and I will, praise to, uh, I will pr- sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. She's singing to God an entire chapter. See, that just logically should come out of you. That's exactly what happened to Zacharias. God says, I'm going to take you and your wife in your old age, give you the messianic forerunner. His name shall be John. And from that great truth, as he moves from unbelief to belief, he can do nothing but just praise God. Psalm 51 is a great psalm about David coming clean of his sin with Bathsheba, his marital infidelity, the stain on his life. But in verse 15, when he comes clean of his sin, notice what he prays. What does he pray? Oh, Lord, do what? Open my lips. What closed his lips? His sin. His sin. See, if you're not praising God, like a torrent of water coming out of that dam, it's probably related back to sin of some sorts. David says, Lord, open my lips. Why? That my mouth may declare your praise. See, that's what a godly person maturing in God does. They ask for God to help them have a mouth. That, that might be what you need to pray sometime today. God, forgive me for not opening my mouth to praise. And may I say more praiseworthy things. Now, we want to get to the essence of what he praised God for. Verse 68, notice what he says. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. That's his first praise. Now, we in English will read by, right past that and think, that, that doesn't mean that much. Oh, yeah, it does. What's his occupation? Zacharias? He's a priest. Who knows the Old Testament? Uh, he does. 
you have to ask yourself, when he says, blessed be the Lord, first of all, realize the word be, the verb, is not in the original text. Meaning, if you, it's called ellipsis. If you leave the verb out of a sentence, uh, it makes it totally emphatic. Totally stresses the verse. He says, blessed the Lord God of Israel, Baruch Yahweh. That's what he says. Uh, you must ask yourself as an interpreter, this is not by accident that he quoted this. Where, is, where does that occur in the Old Testament? When and who utters it? He knows his Old Testament. In Genesis 9, 26, the first person to ever say Baruch Yahweh, blessed is the Lord, in the entire Bible is Noah after the flood. Notice what he says in verse 26. And he said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, his son, and let Canaan be his servant. You might read past that and think, okay, blessed be God. Yeah, yeah, bless, yeah, blessed, yeah, Shem, yeah, 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 yeah. Who's Shem? Shem, if you study any kind of pedigree of the Messiah, is way up the food chain. The great, 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 great uh, of grandfather of Jesus, the Savior. See, the first time you find Baruch Yahweh, blessed is the Lord, in the Old Testament, it comes from the lips of Noah concerning the coming of the Messianic one. The second time you find it is in Genesis chapter 24, verse 27. This time it comes from the lips of Abraham's servant who went out to look for a bride for his son Isaac. Imagine this one. I'm so glad I was born in the West. Because in that culture, the servant went out to find a bride for you. Imagine. The, guy just, the guy's just going to come back and go, hey, here she is. And you've got to go, hey, I'm, go I'm going with that. Thanks. Thanks for picking. How many guys would say, that's how I want to pick my wife? No, no takers? Yeah, that's not happening. That's what they did in that culture. Servant goes out, finds a young lady named Rebecca. Not by chance. And when he finds that, that particular young woman who would become a progenitor of the Messiah, he says in verse 27, Genesis 24, and he said, blessed be the Lord, second time it's occurred, or third time it's occurred, or wait, second time it's occurred, blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and his truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has, has guided me, providentially he's saying, in the way to the house of my master's brothers. It's not by chance I run into this young woman. This is the right young woman by God's choice. Who would she become? Well, the forerunner of the Messiah. See, when Old Zechariah says, blessed be the Lord. He's just merely quoting the Old Testament plan of God to bring the Savior. Third time it occurs, comes from the lips of uh, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses. Exodus 18, where he says to, to Moses, blessed be the Lord who delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of Pharaoh. Moses, remember, bless the Lord. Jesus will become the greater Moses. See, all these things are pointing forward to the work of God as the great redeemer. And the fourth time, and not the last time, the fourth time that phrase occurs is most interesting. It occurs in the book of uh, Ruth, chapter 4, last chapter of the book, where the women uh, from the local town come to Naomi, who's lost both of her sons, and she now has a, a, a Gentile Moabitess daughter-in-law, Ruth, who's now fallen in love with a family member named Boaz, who's going to step in and, and according to Levitical law, become the redeemer of the family by stepping in where the son has died to be the husband of the young lady. Notice what they say to her. Blessed is the Lord, who has not left you without a redeemer today. I, and may his name become famous in Israel. This is an amazing statement because Boaz and Ruth, the Jew and the Gentile that got married, through their family line will come David, David, King David. Through David will come the Messiah, the Messiah, Jesus. See, do you think it's by accident that old Zacharias said, blessed is the Lord? Oh, no, no. What this tells us by way of interpretation is he's saying praise with great specificity. You hear me? His praise has great edges to it. He knows exactly what he's praying. If you really want to praise God, just pick up your Bible, start reading it, and praise God for what you see. Like the Christmas story. What can you praise God for? He's saying, God, I praise you for what you've done because you have fulfilled your word to bless us with a redeemer. Notice what he says. Next statement. Zechariah says, for he, God, uh, he's visited us and he's accomplished redemption for his people. Is that past, present, or future tense? I know, and I, I know it's Sunday. You hate grammar. It's okay. We're here to love grammar, aren't we? Past, present, or future tense? Past tense. Now think about this theologically. Has Jesus gone to the cross yet when he said this? No. Why is it past tense? The reason why it's past tense? He's gone from unbelief to belief. 
how strong is the belief of Zacharias in the coming of the Savior and the Messiah? So much so he speaks about as if it's past tense. See? Isaiah chapter 60, I would submit to you to read sometime, maybe today, small group, great activity. And just pay attention to, it promises that God will one day come, the whole chapter, and redeem his people Israel and bring total peace to their land. And he's going to bring it through the Goel, through the Redeemer who will save them. Well, that Redeemer is is going to be the Messiah Jesus that John the Baptist will point to. We know Jesus is the Savior because of what we read in Luke when the angel comes and talks to the, the shepherds. In verse 11, he says about Jesus, For in today the city of David there has been born for you a Savior. Who is he? He's Christ. He's the Messiah. He's the Lord. He's God in the flesh. Writing in the book of Titus, chapter 2, verse 13, now Paul says this about the Savior Jesus. He says, we as uh, Christians are looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Who is he? Well, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people of his own possession, zealous to good deeds. See, Paul says, I know that Savior. He was prophesied in Isaiah to come. He came, and Zacharias, his old dad, is getting to praise God for sending the Savior. What greater thing can you do at Christmas than to stop and be a gate of praise to God Almighty for the Christmas story. You don't just sing away in a major. You don't just sing the Revelation song and then move on to the next thing. It comes from a heart that is so excited about God's love for us to redeem us. It just gushes out. And if it hasn't been gushing out of your soul lately because of a variety of things, well, then just join David to say, God, loosen my lips so they can praise you. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for Zacharias. Uh, insignificant by the world standards, major significant by spiritual standards. He teaches us a lot about integrity, about humility, but he teaches us most about moving from unbelief in your plan to belief and then to take that belief and use great praise to surround your throne with his great words built specifically from text from the Old Testament. And we pray that his, his same joyous, energetic spirit would become our joyous, energetic spirit especially at this Christmas time, uh, flow in and out of us like a mighty torrent from a dam that's been opened. And uh, may we praise you. And may that begin today as we begin to walk anew with you. Bless our tithes and our offerings today. Might they become a, a, a giant point of praise for you for all that you've done and sending your son in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you.